cool, sweet, got thumbs up. Yeah, all right, so Figma, uh, what is it? <laughs> Why should you care about it? Um, so yeah, Figma is basically just a design tool and a prototyping tool. So if you are you know, a web designer or a mobile apps designer or anything like that, you, this is kind of the most new tool on the market. You've probably seen like, you know, way back in the day, you could just use Photoshop to make your design files. You could, after that, you know, there's kind of Sketch hopped in and then XD happened from Adobe and nobody paid in, any mind until like maybe a year ago. Um, and then, yeah, now we're kind of at Figma. So, you know, with Sketch, if you're familiar with that one, most people are, you kind of had the Sketch piece and then you had the Envision piece. So Sketch is basically where you could design your layouts and everything, and then Envision was where you could actually like user test it before anybody developed it. So you could stick it in like a web mockup and actually like use the site, put in animations, and like do all of the testing you wanted to do before you pass it off to development. Where Figma actually does all of it in the same tool, and it's a web app. So you can download a native app as well, but you can also do all of that within the browser if you, if you want to, which is really cool. Um, the other thing that's awesome about it is it has a phone mirroring app. So if you're in a Figma file and you click on one of your designs that's meant for mobile and you're signed in to the mirroring app, you can just open the app and it'll show you your design and you can use it on your phone. So that's pretty neat. Um, really good prototyping and testing tool, but um, yeah, so the other thing that's nice is it, it, it is cross-platform because it's a web app. So, you know, Sketch for a long time was like Mac only. And they recently made a cross-platform, but Figma, it's like it's in the browser. You don't have to worry about your operating system. So that's cool. The other big like up, upside to it is you can access it for free. You can like, there's limitations to what you can do in the free version, but it's still enough to be useful, especially if you're just trying it out. And it's, it's a thing where if you can kind of show off in it, you could probably convince your company to get it, get your license. So that, yeah, it's a, it's a very helpful tool, but yeah, it's, it's enough to be helpful. You can get like one free file in like one folder and you can have unlimited drafts. So you can try anything out if you want to. Um, having an account isn't a nightmare. Yes, looking at Adobe, <laughs> that kind of, you know, they did a bunch of updates with how their users work. And especially if you're in an education setting, Adobe's account setup process is really difficult. So this is a really good way to get, you know, any students that you know and, and like universities even to have easier access to getting students to sign in without these big bulk enterprise accounts. So that's kind of cool. Um, and then, yeah, it, one thing that's really cool about Figma is it does, in a way, mimic the development process. So hopefully as we go through this, you'll kind of see like, this is a design tool, but it also is for people that think like developers. So that'll be hopefully kind of natural. The unnatural part will be like the visual nature of it, but then as we look at it, it'll, it'll be cool. And then the biggest thing is collaboration in it. This is like a Google Doc. You can see everybody's cursor that's in the same document and you can live edit designs, which is like, I don't know any other tool that's done that yet. So it's super cool. Um, and then it's powerful but not bloated, so you know, it's not gonna bog down your machine. And then, yeah, the only other thing I can think about that's like kind of cool and nerdy is like, if you get the full version, you can actually do versioning, like, like Git in it, where you can create branches and like it'll track your design changes and you can basically do like merge requests within Figma, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, it does, it does these things well. Um, it, it's really great for design systems. Um, especially like when you're managing them visually, you can basically set them up the exact same way you have them in code. So anyway, well, I've pretty much covered the rest of that and we can jump right in. So the rest of this time that I am talking, I'm gonna show you some ways that you can start using Figma. And believe it or not, we've been in Figma already using it for a presentation. Look at that, there it is. <laughs> So, and then for the um, design that we um, had for our group, um, yeah, we, that was also made in Figma. So, I have these in the corner here. Let me know if you can't see them, but that way you can see what keyboard shortcuts I'm doing, because there's a lot of them in Figma. So, those will be kind of important. Um, so, let's go ahead and go to my demo doc. These are the pages 
So you can create a bunch of pages within a file. That way you can divvy it up however you want to. So those are going to be different than you know, your traditional artboard. So I'm going to start with just like some basic functionality inside of Figma, right? Nothing crazy designed or anything like that. Just like how, how use. <laughs> so um, yeah, obviously what I'm doing right now, I'm using my trackpad. There's a lot of different ways you could you know, walk around Figma, for example. So like, um, if you're using your mouse, you can hit space and hold down and it becomes a little hand and it gives you a trackpad feel. Um, plus and minus are just zooming in and out. Um, so that's pretty standard. So yeah, you have most of your tools up here in this toolbar. Um, you got, you know, rectangle, line, arrow, ellipse, polygon, you name it, you got it. Um, so yeah, just to make a square, you can hit like R and, you know, draw a rectangle. Same thing with all these other shapes. One thing I will point out that's really interesting, and you'll see me hit V a lot, and that's just an escape character to get back to my normal pointer. So V is a very helpful keyboard command, and you'll see it a lot. Um, so for your lines, you can basically do all the same things you would do when you're developing a stroke anyway. So you can have kind of like a blunt, you know, cut off. You can have a, a dashed line. You can have the ends rounded. Um, this is just a helpful thing to know is like there's a variation of a line that can be an arrow. You would change all of these settings over here. So there's these panels up here. You'll mostly be in the design panel until you want to move on to prototyping. Um, so yeah, like down here, you know, you can see that I have these endpoints set to rounded on this one over here. How, how do you select dash? That's a great question. Um, you can hit this little more icon and that gives you most of your options down here where you can set those up. You can set like if you had two endpoints coming together, you can decide how you want the joints to operate as well. Um, text, you can go up here and use this text block or you can hit T. Um, there's a couple cool things about that. You know, you could draw a text box and you know, put in whatever you want. And then if you hit escape, it gets you out of your text box. So that's helpful to know if you're ever stuck inside a text box and don't know why you can't get out of it. You can just hit escape because hitting V will, you know, type Vs. Um, <laughs> so um, something you can do, you know, you can do all your normal like justification of things. You can have it sitting in the middle of your window, locking to the bottom, locking to the top. The other thing you can do that's really nice for, for a lot of alignment things is, you know, you can have it auto align to the height. So that way your text box isn't longer and you're like, why does my spacing look off when you have a bunch of those, you know? You can have it snap to what it is and same thing with width. You can have it shrink to the size. And that'll be really helpful when you're making things like buttons. And you're like, why is my text box so big? Um, so yeah, and then the color controls are, should look familiar if you're used to working in things like this, um, where you can just drag this around and change the color. You know, you can change the opacity. All the all that kind of you can just enter a hex key. You can change the setting and enter whatever else you want. You can even enter CSS. Isn't that fun? Um, you can see all the colors being used in your document. You can even go down here and change these settings, which you know will mimic CSS settings as well. If you were to use different kinds of um, why can't I think of the word filters? Not filters, but yeah. I don't know, you know what I mean, you're seeing them. <laughs> so the other thing you can do is gradients. So, you know, we have all these different types of gradients. You can even change it to an image if you want to, which is crazy. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different options in this color panel and you're like, well, that's annoying. I have to remember all these colors all the time. Um, but you can, the thing that Figma does really well is organizes all your stuff. So if you found a color you like, you can hit those four boxes and hit the plus button and basically you get all of your colors there. And you know, in, in the more robust versions of Figma, you can have your colors divided by files. So when you're down here, you know, you can see that it says like Noel's personal projects team library. That's the name of my folder. So all of the colors that I have in that folder show up here organized that way. And then Violent, you taught me a shortcut just before I got up here, which is <laughs> You can hit the slash, <laughs> so if, if I hit add, and you hit a slash, and then you say, like, demo. 
Yeah, yeah. Wait, so <laughs> maybe I shouldn't show this because I don't know how to do this. But you can create folders, right? You don't start with Slack, but you Oh, you don't? Slash comes later. Slash comes later, demo. Slash. Okay. Can I do that? Look at that. Okay, I'm, I'm excited to see this, so I'm going to. Hey, look, we have a folder. <laughs> Now, you know, if you want to change the size of it, you can select your rectangle. <laughs> so, yeah, there we go. And now you can see that it's um, going to show you the name of it rather than just the hex value of it. Um, and the nice thing about that is you can think about, you know, when you're making a better bus file, you can think about that like faster. Like, why would I type this in? Why would I hard code this when I could use this color? So, if I, like, for example, this this teal color, right? I'm using it several different places. It's going to work the exact same way as CSS. I can click on it, I can right click on it, edit the style, decide I want a different color, and all of it. So, that's really great for me. Think about it the same way you would. So, not like you can have nested frames, in so, here, which is kind of different than, yeah. than a lot of visual um, editors. The other thing, so, so I would get smart box. You know, I could, um, <laughs> so I frame, and then I uh, this is an SVG, so I just wanted to show how so, thick my handle is. What I did models, is you know, never want a pirate you know, or a logo. I don't recommend it. You can see that it's already snapping this frame. You can go in and copy the SVG code and paste it in here, and it'll just paste. Which is unique too. Like if you try to do that in Adobe Illustrator, it'll give you a code block of like SVG code. And here, it just renders the image that you're hoping to edit, which is very nice. Um, so you know, when you're in here, it knows what color it is. I think, yeah. So there we go. If we do that and edit. That, uh, that's the outside of it. That's what's going on. There we go. This guy, you can change the color of it. Not our brand color, so don't tell them I did that. <laughs> so the other thing, so these are, these are all just like quick tips and things that I think like, you know, if you don't have a design team and you're the developer that's like asked to be doing design suddenly, these are kind of some helpful things to know to like create your own assets. This is a really common problem I've seen for people where it's like, Here's this really colorful PNG, but now I need it on, you know, a black background and the contrast isn't right or something like that. And, you know, I wouldn't recommend using Instagram PNGs. There's plenty of other ways to get an Instagram logo on your website. But for the example, it's like if we took this, and I'm going to use a modifier key. So notice that my uh, cursor changes to this, like, double cursor. So I can just drag it while I'm holding down Option and... There we go, I have another one. This is great. So um, the way that you can get this to be a different color, even as a PNG, is we're going to just draw a rectangle over it. And then we're going to select both of them. So I just drag my arrow over it, and that one's beneath it. And then right up here, there's this mask tool. And you just click it. And now it's a different color. And you can change that to one of your color variables or anything like that. And you can have all these different PNGs in any way that you need them to be for, for your designs. Again. This is free. This is great. Even if you use it for nothing else but asset management, like get a free account. It'll help you out. Um, then there's like paths that you can do. So if you've seen the pen tool in like Adobe Illustrator or anything like that, it's basically a drawing tool for vectors. So you know you can make all these busier curves. Um, same thing there. You can hit escape to get out of editing that. And then you know you can delete it, all that. Some fun things you can do to like learn how to draw with vectors is like look up. This is this is a flag. You know, this is maybe an asset you would want to create to like put on a website or something like that. You can do that. You you know, once you connect the borders of it, you can set a fill color, set a stroke color. So I'm just using this gradient that I created, and um, yeah. So, but one way you can do like practice. This is just a silly little toucan I made. Um, but you know, you can look up a picture of an animal and try to trace it. So um, let's see if I can get him to move here. Uh, there we go. So like this, you know. So you can you can find an animal and like try to use the pen tool to try to just trace basic shapes and curves and things, and you'll get a feel for for how to do that by by trying to do things like that. So I, I dropped this image in here. I just copied and pasted it. You can do that. Um, you don't have to like download an image and throw it into Figma. You can just like literally hit copy image and paste it in here and it'll show up. And then I just changed the um, you know, opacity down so that I could see what I was working on a little bit easier. So 
Um, the other thing is like images and cropping images and having them, you know, fit your grid. Like, how do you do that? <laughs> so one one really nice thing is if you're creating a layout and you want to use boxes to just like, I don't have a particular image in mind, but I would like an image to be here and I'd like it to be this height and width on my grid that I'm using, which I'll show you how to set up. But you can just draw your rectangle and take your image and drag it into the rectangle. So, you know, for example, here's a rectangle, here's an image, I'm gonna duplicate it, and then I'm gonna drag it here. And I, and I kinda lied, I, I set this up wrong because you do just mask it. Um, I think this rectangle needs to be on the bottom of this image. So that, that is one thing, the order of your layers which is all over here, does matter when you're masking things. Um, so I'm gonna hit that on top of there, select both of them, hit mask, okay, cool. Now, you know, if you wanna change the size of it, you can select your rectangle over here, it automatically makes it into a little group, and you can drag it around and change that. Say you wanna change the position of your image, you can drag it around too. So that's nice. One better, if you don't want to deal with rectangles, is you've seen like these artboards that I'm using, right? And that's kind of the traditional sense of like, yeah, most design tools have artboards, and that's just like your space that you could like, you know, potentially export or you know, prototype all of those kinds of things. Um, this is all just kind of the extra space. Um, but Figma is unique in that mostly everything that it creates are frames. So not like you can have nested frames in here, which is kind of different than, than a lot of visual editors. So in this case, you know, I could set up a frame and then I wouldn't have to deal with the rectangle. So it can just kind of keep your files a little bit cleaner. So like, you know, if I drug this onto that frame, you can see that it's already like snapping to this frame and like trying to crop itself. And you can just do that by drawing a new frame, setting it up to the exact width that you want on another frame that has your grid. Um, but if that sounds confusing, I'll, I'll hop over to a grid so that we can like look at some of these things and why do I keep talking about a grid, right? So, you know, this is, those, those are the basic tools of Figma and I'll stop here before I get into other things to ask if there's like any questions about just like any of the tools that I just showed. And I can repeat things too. What's the underlying codes of creating HTML? What's it creating underneath? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. You can, so like if I click on this, I don't know that this is necessarily like what it's using. Actually, that's a good question, but you can go over to inspect. This is another thing that you should be aware of. It gives you sample HTML code for all of your assets that you create. So, I mean, like CSS, you can change it to other things too. So, if you're an app developer, you can switch and toggle and get whatever output. But as far as like what Figma itself is using, yeah, just I actually push. don't know. I have to. I have to Canvas. Look it up. You know? Canvas. Canvas? HTML Canvas. Okay. That's sweet. Yeah. So you yeah. can plug in the export. Yeah. So you can explore yeah. this yeah. various kind of right. Yep. Yeah, and so yeah, you're you're totally right. I should go over exporting. So if you're in design, there's this little export area. So if you have something selected, you can hit export. Mm-hmm. Yep. So you know you can figure out your scaling that you want on it and you can pick what, you know, how you want to do it. It's SVG editor is pretty good. Um, I, I'm okay with it. The one, the one thing that I've run into with the SVG editor in particular is sometimes you have to go in and edit it because it'll, it'll apply all the CSS to it, which is nice unless you want to control the CSS. Um, so you could either make a simplified version of it. The only time it matters is like if it, say you had a bunch of boxes in a row, it's gonna take that box and transform it over and over and over again. So if you were hoping to use like transform on your SVG, you might run into problems. So you'd have to go in and actually manually like create a new path for each of those boxes instead of doing maybe the default of what this does. But if you're not wanting to do anything crazy with an SVG, generally this export works fine. Um, Can you copy the SVG code to another place and then paste it yeah. back from it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, there's, there's some cool online resources for like helping you, not associated with Figma, but that can help you edit SVG code if, if you're not familiar with it, which that's a whole. <laughs> so, don't ask me to make a SVG from scratch. That's 
<laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, kind of moving on to like, how would you set up a document to like actually design something? Um, I'm gonna do like five more minutes and then I'll pass it on to you. But yeah. So have you touched on? Are you going to touch on design systems and style guides? I don't think I have time to touch on that. <laughs> That's a whole. <laughs> we could talk about that all day. You know, I was hoping. Like, I'm, I'm hoping to get to this part at some point. <laughs> so I, <laughs> yeah, it works well with them. It works really well. Um, you know, you create components. You can create components in here, too. Um, okay. Yeah. I don't want to wanna steal all your time. But if people are okay with staying later, then I can keep going. But <laughs> all right. We'll do that. When the pizza gets here, I stop. Um, so anyway, yeah, so, so when you want to make a frame or an artboard, right, you want to make it a specific size. So, you know, generally you're going to be designing for mobile tablet and desktop. Um, I'm a big fan of mobile first, so I put it first. <laughs> but um, it means more than that, obviously. Um, so th the way that you can set these up is, you know, if we were going to recreate these, I'll go ahead and get rid of these little ghosts. Um, I can hit F and over here in design it knows that I'm making a frame, right? So I could have gone up here and clicked this little hash mark too. Um, but you can go under here and it has a bunch of predefined sizes that you can just choose from. So what I personally recommend to do is for phone, pick the one that has the smallest width because that's going to be the toughest one to actually get to work um, with all of your content. So that's just generally what I try to do if you're working within a design system then you'll want to check with like what you design mobile for so don't just assume if you are working within something like that um, and and if you have access you know to a designer that's familiar with it you can just be like hey and they'll probably tell you um, so I just clicked that it created a new one for me but how do I get these cool fancy grids on here right the other thing that I'll mention are these rulers here um, you can toggle those on and off with shift R. Um, they're on mine by default because I, that's the way I set up my documents. But if you jump into Figma, you might not have them immediately. There's some handy things you can do with it, like drag a guide over from one. And you can do that with the vertical ones as well. Um, the way you get rid of guides is you can just drag it back up and your little cursor will show an X and you can get rid of them. So <clears throat> the way you set up a grid, though, is you can, there's this little thing called layout grid. And similarly, anytime you see that little like four dot icon, that basically means that you can have a predefined style. So if you want to use the same grid over and over again, you can do the same thing. You can set up a grid, set it as a variable, and then use it. Um, or you can create one from scratch. So from default, it just like creates this pixel grid, um, which isn't always the most useful. It depends on what you're working on. But what you can do is you can hit layout grid settings from here. And instead of grid, you can change it to columns, which is most likely what you're going to be working with on web. Um, one thing I will mention, if you're not familiar with setting up grids, is 12 column grids, much like a lot of, you know, development frameworks when that use grids, they're, they're mostly operating off a of 12 system grid. So like you can, like, I don't know, an, an old one is foundations, but I think Bootstrap also uses a 12 column grid. Um, so if you want to like make your life easier for like developing different column widths and things like that, I would use a 12 column grid and then, you know, drop down to four on mobile, try to keep 12 on tablet as well. Um, you can change how many columns you have on tablet, but I find like transitioning different layouts that can still live next to each other is a little bit easier if, if you do that. Um, but anyway, yeah, so you, you have this, but you know, you're seeing that there's a couple different things that look different about those grids I have set up and that little, little guy here. So I gave myself a little cheat sheet. We have a four column, 22 margin, 22 gutter. What, what in the heck is a gutter, right? <laughs> um, so margin makes sense. We want the edge of the of the grid to have outside spacing. So we can go up here and just change margin to 22 and then hit enter and we can see that we have we have that on the outside. Um, 
Also, I'm going to change that to four. That's just the count of columns that I have. And then the gutter is set to 20. So the 20, the gutter is just the space in between the columns. Um, so you can think about like column padding, and you can just adjust that. It's called a gutter in here. Um, there we go. So now, now that's set up so that we can you know, drag different things, snap to it, know that you know, our content's never going to extend past these unless I'm making something full width. Um, same thing on, on these other ones. And you, know, you can save the preset, and you can change the grid color if you want to. Um, the other thing I'll mention is the only way to set up grids is if it's a frame. So you can't set a frame up on a rectangle, but you can on a frame. You can't set a grid up on, on a group necessarily. A group is something else that I'll touch on. But you know, a lot of times Figma knows what you, what you want to do. And if you try to apply something to it that it can't, it'll just automatically change it to a frame. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's that. Um, any questions about like setting up grids and why you would want to set them up a certain way or, or not? Cool. <laughs> All right. Um, so groups, yay. Here's, here's a fun thing. We're actually looking at how you would use a grid in, in a web layout. And um, this is something that, that I, I just think is funny. Um, if, so Unsplash is a really good resource for free images that are high quality that you don't have to pay for. You can just grab them and use them anywhere. And it's great. You don't have to worry about um, licensing issues. But there is this thing called Boxed Water, and they're like a company, but they like throw all their actual images for their brand up there. Um, and anyway, I used Hipster Ipsum for it because it seemed appropriate. Anyway, so if you're used to Lorem Ipsum, it's, this is Hipster Ipsum. Um, so that's fun to read. <laughs> it is a thing. <laughs> you can go to like, if you just Google hipster ipsum, you can copy and paste it and just randomly generate like funny hipster terms. It is like, yeah, like, <laughs> it's funny. I love it. It's my, yeah, <laughs> it's my favorite ipsum. <laughs> but um, anyway, I, I don't know, box water seemed to fit the whole thing. But <laughs> anyway, so. There's one thing that, that I think I want to point out immediately, and that is how did I get this icon in there? And this is really cool about Figma. You can install plugins that allow you access to different libraries. So if you know in your project that you're going to be using Font Awesome, you can get a Font Awesome plugin and have access to all of the icons and write them in line with your text. You can just drag them and drop them different places. So you know, if I was just you know over here, I have the plugin already. So there's my font. I awesome icons, it's going to pop up this little little icon, and I can hit Airbnb. Whoop. Where'd it go? Where's Airbnb? It's probably snapping somewhere that I can't see it because it's useful. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Or maybe I can drag it. Can I drag it? No. There we go. There it is. And it actually creates a frame for it. So the nice thing about that is um, you know, if you're using a standalone icon, it's automatically providing the correct spacing for like the active area and then the icon area, if you're familiar with that. Um, so you know, if you're planning on using it for a clickable space, it's giving you that clickable space instead of just the actual icon. Um, same thing, so if you like, made a text area and you said, like, hey, <laughs> look how large that text is. Let's just do that and that. And we were in line here. And then I went up and said, OK, I want a font awesome icon at the end of hey. Then I could do that, and it didn't do what I wanted. So <laughs> but um, yeah, I'd, I'd have to play around with that. I know I've gotten it to work before, but you, you should be able to get it in line with your text. Um, <clears throat> I know, I, I've, I'd have big talk and have no results to show. But, um, but what I wanted to kind of show is that you know, as you're working on things, you might want things to kind of live together in groups because you're going to be thinking about things in groups. You can think about groups as divs, right? Same thing. It's like, OK, how does this chunk of content relate to another chunk of content? So when you're looking at this and you're like, how would I develop this? You can group them the same way. So over here, you know, we have these two, like this icon and, and this in the same in the same way. You can have these all the same way. And you know, if you really want to be like, oh, super, super div, you know, you can you can make this whole thing a group. 
Um, and that'll be represented over here in your layers panel. And you can name them different things that are more meaningful than group two, group four, all that. But the way you do that is you norm like the way I usually do it is I just hit control G and that'll make it a group. And if you ever want to undo that while it's selected, you can hit um, you know, command control shift G and that'll ungroup something. So that's nice. Um, the other thing that I'll point out is, you know, if you group something, you can see up here that there's this little drop down called group. If you ever want to just change that to a frame real quick, because why not, you can do that and it's now a frame. Um, so that's nice, especially if you, know, you have a rectangle, like I was talking about earlier, and you don't want to have a rectangle and you'd rather it be controlled by the frame. So like, for example, if, if I wanted this background color to not be black anymore, just in this little div that I have, which you know, is unlikely, but um, it, it's useful in other scenarios. Um, you can add a fill, and since my text is white, it looks crazy. But um, let's change that to like green. There we go. Now the text is green and the background's white. <coughs> so you can kind of control frames in that way. Um, the other thing that, you know, if you're doing something like this, this looks like a repeatable module, right? It's like, so now every time I want to use this module, do I, do I you know, drag it over here and just reuse it a bunch of times? Oh no, what if I change the spacing on this one? And I have to go back to all those other groups and change the spacing again, right? Well, that's where components come in. So it's like, you know, you could think about this kind of like a Brad Frost, like atom molecule. What's the last one? Why can't I think of it? Is it pattern? No. What is it? Somebody, somebody knows this, right? <laughs> yeah, React components. Yeah. So um, if we're over here and we're looking at the same page as a component, you can look at this and, oh, what did it do? Oh, it, it decomponentized it. Okay. So, you know, you can think about, okay, I want this button to be repeatable. I want this header to be repeatable. So, you know, if I make this up here and I decide, you know, I no longer want this to be, you know, this color or something like that, you can change it and it'll universally change all of them everywhere. The thing about Figma is it's not limited to just your file. If you change your master component and you're using that component in multiple files, it changes them in all of your files. So that's something you really have to think about, especially when you're creating, like, if you do want to create a design system, this is where it comes in handy because, you know, you have all of your marketing pages that have these controls behind them. And um, yeah, you can think about it a lot like React where you, know, you, have, you have an object and you're passing it in. That's basically the same thing you're doing here, just in design. Um, the other really cool thing about components, so if you ever want to create a component, say I want this you know, text and paragraph and list to be a component, you go up here to this and it'll show you the keyboard shortcut for it as well. Um, or you can just click it and it'll become a component. The other really powerful thing about components is you can create variables from them. So here are my master components for different variables. So this is without an icon, this is with an icon, this is like, you know, on light, this is, you know, my primary button on light, this is my primary button on dark. Um, so those will be really helpful. So like if I'm over here and I decide, oh, I actually don't want this to have an icon, I've set up a variable so I can hit this drop down and hit default and it gets rid of it, and it's not a separate component. It's the same thing, but you can think about it like if you're doing you know, BEM, it's like your modifier at the end, um, it, or like you know, button dash dash primary, button dash dash secondary, or anything like that. Um, it, it works in a similar, in a similar way. Um, so I'm gonna change that back to icon. Um, with, with text, it's smart in that, you know, I could change this text and it would still be the same component, but it wouldn't change my master component. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, so, you know, you can see that by doing like, hello. And my master component's fine with that. Um, so, so those are, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> let's create another button variable. So here's my main button area, right? And um, it says I have two variants. It looks like I could probably just hit this plus button here, <clears throat> but there's also over here, you know, variants. So we could add a new variant. Yeah. So then you can click that 
and it'll replicate your button like on a nice little spaced out grid area. And so say that we want this one to be like something crazy like green. You can go in here. Another really helpful command is like if you when you start making more complex components, you're gonna sit there and try to click and click and click and click and click down to the exact layer that you want to edit. And that's really annoying. Same thing with groups, because then you end up like me. But <laughs> you can just hit command and click and it'll take you directly to the like layer you want to edit. So, you know, if I just clicked on this, it would be the whole component, and then I'd have to, yeah, you get it. Um, and so I'm going to change the fill of this to like this crazy green. And, and now I have that as an option globally wherever I'm using a button. So I could go down here now and hit green, and then it would be green. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is a lot of fun for, and just really helpful for managing different things. How are they scoped? Scoped meaning? Yeah, where, where are they visible? Are they visible just on that page? Are they visible globally? Um, like the variables? Yeah, yep. So anytime you have, so it does work a lot like, an, like you can think of every, like this is your master, like, file, right? And every instance of button has all of the capabilities of master button. Um, and, and you can use it. So it is really like, you know, you're taking the whole thing and rather than like passing in a very specific thing, like you have all the capabilities every time you pass it in globally, no matter what file you're in. So if the component has it, your file has it. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of components. One, one thing that I did want to touch on that, you know, is a little bit difficult to explain to a lot of designers that don't know how to develop, especially in CSS, is they have, they have something that's called, um, I think it's called auto alignment, uh, auto layout, there it is, yeah. Which this little auto layout thing is really helpful for, you know, when you have a component you don't want, you wanna control, like this, this heading for example, you know, the way that it snaps when it changes, like it snaps back to the edge, it knows to do that because I'm using auto layout. If it didn't have that auto layout, it would stay exactly where it is and there'd be a gap where the icon is, so you just have a space there. But basically the way auto layout works is it's flex box. So you can think about it the same way. So I'll, I'll illustrate this by just like drawing some rectangles. Um, so let's see here, yeah. Um, and, and also a really helpful thing is if you want to draw a rectangle, that's all well and good, but how do you make a square? You could sit here, you could enter the exact values, or you could hold shift and you just have a square. Same thing with circles and ovals and, and all things that you want to not have be weird ratios. Um, but yeah, so if we do this and then uh, I'm going to hold shift again. And, and option because I'm, I'm copying it and I'm keeping it in line with the other one. And I'm going to purposefully space them out, really annoying, because that will prove the point here. So there we go. They're not equally spaced. Oh no, what do we do? So I'm going to hit it, make it a group, and then I'm actually going to change it to a frame because that's how auto layout works. And then over here I'm going to hit auto layout. And Notice that it just like spaced it evenly, like you would in Flexbox. Um, and that's because I have it pointing that direction. Now, if I hit vertical, then you're gonna be getting like align items, basically. So you're switching between justify content and align items. Um, and so, you know, you can also change the spacing. One thing that I really like to point out to people is like you could do this and use your arrow keys, or you could, you know, um, where did it go? Oh, frame. There we go. Um, your cursor changes to arrows, and you can slide it. So that's really helpful. Um, and so you can slide it. You can also set up padding for each of the elements, which is really nice. And then you can come over here, and you know you can do you can you can specify that it's spaced between if you want to or packed. Um, so that's only for different kind of complex layouts that that mimic that a little bit more clearly. But those, those are things that are really nice. So in, in my case, you know, I have this header that is, you know, horizontally having a specific amount of space between it. But just like Flexbox, if that icon goes away, 
your text is going to smack to the first part of because it's display fl display flex. So um, yeah, that's that's kind of a piece that's really nifty. If especially like in buttons too, that's a really nice thing to do auto layouts on because like when I'm typing this, I want the rectangle to dynamically change with me not just have the rectangle stay there and me have to drag the rectangle out every time I change my text. So that's, that's the same use case there. Um, so yeah, that's kind of mostly what I had. Um, I don't think I had anything else hiding in here. Oh, yeah, you're right. I actually did have more, and there's more. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm actually going to switch over to Chrome real quick because this is really interesting and will be really helpful for a lot of people. So Figma has a community online, which is really helpful if, you know, maybe you haven't, you know, gone to design school and you like don't know all the things that you're supposed to do and like that's totally fine. You don't have to do all that to start a design. Um, you can go here and get plugins that are going to help you out. There's, you know, widgets. There's things called fig jams. So, like, if you ever want to do, like, like a sticky note, you know, type thing, you, you can and, like, move around different things. They have a lot of different fun things. You can, you can also go to just, like, UI kits and basically find a design system that you want and open it up in Figma. So, um, here is, like, the font awesome thing. So, I went on the community and I found this even just, like, a pre-built like page, like website page for mobile, and um, you can you can basically you know open it up, and because it's a browser thing, you can start editing this right in the browser. I set mine up to take me to my app. Um, so, one really good way to get practice is so it's on this page, right? You can see all the components that they have that they use to build this. Um, you can see the different screens that they have for it already pre-built. You could literally just take this and use it. One thing I would really suggest if you're just getting started is to take one of these pages and without copying and pasting, replicate it. And that will give you really, really good practice on exactly what they're doing. And if you get stuck, it's great. You have the answer sheet. You can look at it and see exactly what they did to it in order to make it look that way. So I would highly recommend that. Um, you know, different things like if you know you're going to be using Bootstrap, you can just get the UI kit for it and start designing with Bootstrap visually before you actually ever have to touch it in code to check out ideas and see how it looks before you, you know, spend two hours trying to center something. Um, <laughs> so same thing with like Google's material design. You can get their material design UI kit. Also on Figma, just open it up. Um, so those are, those are all really great resources to get started if you like, just need to use an existing UI kit or you just want practice replicating different designs that you, know, you, you wouldn't come up with initially because you're you know, getting started with this kind of thing. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, sometimes even as a developer, you just want to know how to get things out of a design. So if you ever handed a file, it's like, well, how do I even navigate this thing? Um, one more thing that I will share that's just a keyboard shortcut thing that's really fun is um, if you click on something, this is just pretty universal in a lot of design things, but I always want to point it out to people because it's really helpful. If you just hit option, it tells you how many pixels away it is from everything. So, you know, you don't have to guess. You can know that that div is going to be 60 pixels away from that one. And, and you can just do that by hitting option and hovering over different elements to see what it's relative to. So that's really handy for developers. Um, also, just this inspect panel is really helpful for developers to know, you know what exactly all the things are. By default, it kind of like position absolutes everything, which kind of drives me crazy. But <laughs> um, you can at least like get an idea. Like if you, if you see something kind of tricky, like, oh, how would I do that? Figma might be able to give you a good idea of how to get started. So that's, that's a lot of fun. And then um, one more thing I'll mention about keyboard shortcuts is if you go up to the little Figma icon, do help an account, you can look at all of the keyboard shortcuts that exist in Figma. And it's really fun because the blue ones are the ones you've already done. So it shows you which ones you've done and which ones you haven't done. 
my one critique on this is I wish every time you did a new one, it would give you like an Xbox like award achievement thing, which is like new shortcut unlocked. <laughs> like that would be great. But you can at least kind of keep score over here if you if you like that kind of thing. It was look at look at that. <laughs> we got all those blues. Anyway, but it's just it's just a fun thing that um, you can learn more and you can kind of see what already you've discovered. So anyway, there there are there's. <laughs> <laughs> so those those are cool, but yeah, that's that's all I have. Yep. Thank you. Yeah.